Walk with me through the cellar door. A storm is coming, Francis. A portal to a more skeptical world. Cellar Door Skeptics begins right now. Prepare for the revolution with your hosts, Christopher Tanner and Chris Hanna. In the darkness, we must strive to find the light. We must create a light that will shine on for those struggling. We must work tirelessly to help find answers for those who are ill. Samantha, Samantha did that. She volunteered her time to help find a cure, along with the inspiration talks she gave to those who are much more fortunate than her. Samantha, your light will forever shine. And even as we say goodbye, we will always be able to see your smiling face on each of the people we see, on our loved ones and those who aspire to change humanity. For even though our hearts are dark today and tomorrow doesn't look much brighter, we will strive to embrace your attitude of not giving up. Your strength, your compassion have forever changed me, and I will not forget you. Go now, for your journey is done, Samantha, and we will meet at the clearing at the end of the path of our memories, for we will never forget you. On the death of a friend, we should consider the fates, through confidence, have devolved on us the task of double living, that we have henceforth to fulfill the promise of our friend's life also in our own to the world. Henry David Thoreau. Welcome back to Cellar Door Skeptics. Tonight's episode will be marked probably with some crying, a little bit of craziness, and our tribute to our dear friend Samantha Bannister, who passed away two days ago at 7 a.m. She died of a very rare, very extremely rare brain cancer. And though her, sh- her life has been cut short, her heart will remain strong. If you have the means, please go help the Bannister family out over at GoFundMe forward slash Team Tiny Dancer. And yes, we talked about this last week. And in the unfortunate event that she has passed two days ago, we want to contribute anything that we can to help them out in this time of need. The amount the funeral is going to cost is astronomical. And the amount of grieving that their family will do in the next month, year, century maybe is immense so anything we can do to help out please go over to teamtinydancer.com or you can go to gofundme forward slash teamtinydancer this episode is now dedicated to Samantha Bannister and on that note on that note as we move forward with the episode that Chris and I have planned and and no it, it will not do any much more than what we've talked about tonight. And at some point, we'll, we'll talk with Jeremiah about childhood cancer and atheism. But for tonight, for tonight, we want to talk about American politics. Go figure, right, Hannah? Go figure. Yeah. It's my, my co-host, Mr. Chris Hannah. It's going to be, I mean, it'll be a somber conversation. We, we, we're not planning on just absolutely going out and being loud and rattled and wild podcasts like we have in the past is it it's important to you know take a step back and experience and let life go where it's going and today's been a rough one but um or actually two days ago been a rough one but the um the, we'll talk about you know american politics we'll talk a little bit about immigration we'll we'll just you know we'll we'll do what we do for the show and and while respecting and and, and hoping that that we can you know offer a little bit of 
consolation and uh, condolences and everything to help everyone in the area that's grieving. This is it's just an important it's an important thing, and so like the show must go on, as I always say. So hopefully uh, we can we can provide some some entertainment and some smiles and some goofiness because that's really what we're good for. I mean, nobody, <laughs> that's nobody, all you're nobody, good for. If anything. nobody's nobody's going to be looking to us for um for uh, I guess super uh, specific and and really well written stuff here we're we're pretty much winging it we're gonna ha- we, we're gonna try to get a full show in we we we've minimized our research chris has been running around helping out the banister family and doing all the good stuff that he does so like we just we're gonna, we're gonna put together a couple segments and we'll see how it goes from there right we are but i was very excited I'll, I'll be honest and so so a lot of times i do the research for the shows or i set up a lot of the segments and then hannah does the research on the science stuff and I'll be honest, I, I have been very busy this this week. Um, I have not spent a lot of time at home. I have been been off and above just doing anything I can to help ease the pain. And so Hannah kind of threw this show together, and I'm very excited to see where he gets to lead us tonight because I, I will let Hannah, Hannah talk a little bit more than I usually do. <laughs> usually I try and drown him out because, you know, I mean, his anti-Hillary chatter, his on-his-knees-for-Trump chatter, I mean, sometimes it just gets a little... I don't know, astrandagious or whatever the fuck that word is. That's a but new word. That's that a one's new going word. on the Webster right there. You, there. Know. <laughs> you know me. But we have a science segment, and, and, and I'll be honest, I, I've leaned on the politics a lot, but the science is kind of where I'm feeling it right now. Yeah. And, and maybe maybe it's because Hannah's rubbed off on me, but we had an awesome science segment last week. And then this week, we get to talk about water clouds on other planets. So last yeah. week, we talked about origins of life. And, and, and I'll be honest, Hannah, I, I've done more thinking about this. And I don't want to derail the show, but I have been doing a lot more thinking on this over the past, let's just say last week, about the origins of life. And, and when you sit down, it just makes so much sense. And, and maybe I sound like a creationist here. But in it's reality... the only way it could be, right? Yeah, it, it, it just... <laughs> I, you're right. I don't get it. Like, I do, I do. But, you know, somebody accused me of that. They're like, you really just sound like you're a creationist that uses evolution as creation. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? Explicit one. That is awesome. <laughs> but <clears throat> we... I, I, drank I have the been. science Kool-Aid, man. We did. I did. I drank the science Kool-Aid a little <laughs> bit heavier. Um, over, And maybe it's just, again, because with everything that's happening, I find solace... In science, I yeah. just do. You find solace in something that gives you an answer. There's, there's so much in life that doesn't give you a solid answer. There's, there's, there's very few things that give you like a binary solution. I love mathematics specifically for this reason. As an engineer, I love the fact that you can get an answer. Like, there's only one real answer most of the time, aside from basic assumptions that you make on a problem. And then my wife, she's an artist. Like, so I would, I would. Talked with her about projects and stuff when she's getting her master's degree, <laughs> and she to talk about well, my professor didn't like the fact that I used this one type of image because it's symbolic; it could mean something else. And I was like, "Well, was that what you meant?" She's like, "Well, no, I didn't even mean wrong." Like, then why does his ma- why does his opinion even matter? It like, does. What it. is the problem? Why are they yelling at you? Why didn't you punch them in their face? And it's like that doesn't <laughs> that doesn't that isn't how art works. And so uh, the same kind of thing with, when, when I deal with you know tough situations and in situations where like life and, and all of the, the, uh, the chaos that ensues, uh, the, the human, you know, condition that, you know, I, I find solace in, in science mm-hmm. and numbers and, and binary solutions where I can find an answer and I can go somewhere else and like finding using this, that's the spectrographs of planets to find whether or not what the elements they have is, that's just awesome. Like dwar- actually this is a dwarf star that we're going to talk about, but it's just a really cool, down, you know, down to the numbers type story. Well, don't give the whole thing away. We we want people to at least listen through the second segment. I mean, we're only oh, about eight on. minutes in, or eight and a half minutes in, or some shit like that. It, explicit number two, and we don't we when we don't want to give that away because the first thing we want to talk about is politics, and and we have to. And and if we're becoming too political, reach out and tell us. If we're not, don't, and we'll just keep doing politics. Yeah, we'll keep <laughs> we'll keep doing what we want. And we won't take any kind of criticism. But we would love the criticism, and we would love the escalades, es- escalades, escalade. I would like an escalade. But <laughs> any any conversation you want to have, make sure you throw over to us at cellardoorskeptics at gmail dot com. You could tweet at us at cellardoorskept. You can find us on Facebook, and if I had to say it, you haven't looked at the link section of the thing. And of course, you know we're on Patreon. But the big, the big thing here is that you go to our Facebook page, you like it, subscribe for updates. 
Or if you want to run over to the iTunes, throw us a five-star rating. And yeah, I'm going to be a little bit more like Jeremiah this episode because I've spent a lot of time with him. And so I'm very self-promoting this, this week. But tell us about our first segment, Hannah. Tell us about political Basically, band-aids. Yeah, the, the, I've been trying to find what makes me uncomfortable about current American politics and stuff. And, and in the end, really, it's just coming down to the short-term stuff, like the things that I don't like about the politicians that we have, and obviously the one who's who's basically won the DNC, the Democratic nomination, and you know Hillary is she's she's obviously a better candidate than Trump by far because Trump is just a brain dead. Are idiot. you sure he's a brain dead idiot? And so, like, I would prefer a more progressive candidate. I would prefer someone pushing the you know the envelope a little bit more. But the reason why is because I don't like band aid politics. I'm, kind of basically going over this in my head, trying to find out what makes me uncomfortable about it. And I think that's what it is. I've narrowed it down to like short-term politics. I don't like short-term politics. I don't like knee-jerk reactions. I don't like, you know, one... So, one, so you um, don't sit on the fringe is what you're kind of telling me. You don't want... When that pendulum, pendulum swings, you don't jump on it and hang from it. You just kind of go... Ugh. It's not for me. Yeah. Well, I mean, like the the pendulum swings and 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 the the way that you usually describe that, it's either it's consistently, you know, okay, it's going to get worse each time it comes down. Like I, I mentioned earlier when we were just kind of prepping for the show, one of my um, one of my favorite authors, Edgar Allan Poe, the the pit and the pendulum. There's a scene where you know there's the pendulum swinging each time it drops down a certain amount for each pass. Well, when I picture the pendulum in, in the political sphere. It actually goes the opposite of the uh, the uh, the cosmos thing when they talk about momentum and stuff. Where if you let go of a, a ball on a string, it'll never actually make its way all the way back to hit you in the face. Well, in the political end, it actually does hit you in the face. It comes back faster than it left because there's so many things that were never addressed. There's so many people that are still frustrated, and it gets worse each time. And so it's more conservative, more progressive, more conservative, more progressive, and like those political shifts. Before long, it just becomes a you know a, a, a game and switching back and forth. Like we hate you because you're Democrats. I hate you because you're Republicans. We're not talking about politics or uh, like policy anymore. It's just you know, hating different groups and, and disagreeing with groups because they're different groups. We've lost sight on like really important topics and really important things. And so like that's like that band aid stuff. Everything is short term. Okay, what can I get done in one one term? And if maybe if I'll and have how two. often does it last? I mean, think about it, right? As soon as you take somebody outside of the political spectrum and you move away from that, it changes, right? I mean, look at Michigan. We had a Democratic governor. We had a Democratic House and Senate for a long time. And all of a sudden, boom, we've switched. It's just, it's churned itself over. And and that's the thing is, is so you're right. I agree with you, actually, in this atmosphere that sh- this short-term proposals aren't doing any good. You know, and, and I'm going to critique Obama a little bit because I can't help myself but do it. Well, and we have to. I mean, we, have we have to critique to. everyone. I mean, that's my thing here, right, is that if you look at Obama and you and you look at what he did, it's great. And we, and we do need that. We need to be able to do that. We need to be able to tell the world that we're going to give our country socialized medicine as best we can. But he didn't go far enough. And I know why he didn't. And I get it. But you're right. These short-term politics, if if we lost and got Trump in there, it's going to go backwards. He's going to get bought off in a second. There ain't no way anybody wants or anybody's going to let Trump stick around <laughs> and and not do exactly what he, they say. I I I don't remember if you and I had this conversation if, or if it's is Jeremiah and I from, you know, the past weekend, but we t- I, I remember the conversation about what is Trump going to what's going to happen. Think about it. On day 1, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to grab his ass, throw him in a locked room and say, "Look, you know who the fuck paid your bills? You know who's going to pay your bills and who <laughs> won't impeach you?" Is yeah. going to be the collective that owns that party. We put you in power. You do what we want. Obama, same way. Look, he, he sponsors drones for fuck's sake. Yeah. You know, I, uh, I my guess that I've heard people say this. There's a bunch of comedians. A bunch of people talk about. It. It's like okay, once you're elected, the the first day you have your inauguration speech, you have all the you know the hoopla. Ooh yeah. And then uh, on day two, they put you in a small room in the back. 
and that's where the people who really make decisions are like, you know, conspiracy theorists, whatever. But the, um, like, I do think that there's a lot of stuff that once after the campaigning is done, then these, whatever candidate gets in, they actually gets the, the, you know, the win, they get slapped in the face with a big chunk of reality. And I would think that like the Trump one, if, if the, um, the house and the con and, uh, the Senate weren't switched over. So like if, if Congress and the house of representatives aren't, you know, turned into a democratic majority, then we have, you know, Republican majority in both, both of those two, uh, both uh, the house and, uh, uh, and, uh, Senate and Congress and all that. Then you also have, you know, a Republican in the presidency. So we're removing one of the checks in, you know, keeping the whole system. So we're going to see, you know, regressive stuff as far as, um, conservative angles that, that, that Trump would probably just fall in line with, because I don't think he really understands a lot of the, uh, a lot of the really, really intricate stuff that they've been trying to get done with, like, the, the um, Religious Freedom Restoration Act. I believe that's what it is. RFRA. I think so, yeah. I think and that's so, what it is, And so, like, too. those types of things, I think, would get, you know, shoveled under the rug, just, you know, or under the, the wig, uh, depending on what, what direction you want to take it with, like, the, the Trump presidency. So, like, you know, you're consolidating all that kind of power. I That, that kind of thing, like, that, that collectivized government, that's what I'm worried about. But there's some things that should be bipartisan that should happen all of the time. It's like in an age of immediate satisfaction that we have, like everybody's just like bang, 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 bang. They expect everything. To, they expect the government like to fast change. Food. They expect the government to change as fast as everything else does, though. So like in society, everything is changing so quickly now. So like governments are slow and unwieldy for a reason. This is important. And like I used to complain, like, why isn't the government more efficient? I want them to, to, to spend a dollar better. Well, someone told me, this, like, guess what? Fast governments have concentrated power and efficiency. They can flip you over and, you know, human rights can get just trampled immediately. And so, like, think, you know, think fascism, think dictatorships, think theocracies. These are the things that have all their power concentrated. They're really swift and efficient governments. And this is actually a detriment for the hmm. people. So... I guess if if we look at it, and you're right, that I agree with you, and it makes sense, you know, that's what would happen if we had fast governments, if we had more efficiency, and you're, you know, it's funny, we, we could, if we all had a dollar for every time we heard a libertarian or a conservative talk about how slow the Democrats are, right, or how mm-hmm. slow government changes, and not even, they don't even care about human rights 90% of the time, but... If we had a dollar for every time we heard that, it, we, we'd be rich as shit right now, you know? <laughs> but <clears throat> we, we got to look at, okay, so fine. It is what it is. It's, it, it, we, can't, we can't sit here and nitpick it unless we want to have a conversation about what a long-term platform would look like yeah. and the benefits that would come for it. So, so that's what we need to focus on, right, Chris? I mean, that's almost where we have to go with this. Yeah, we'll stop nitpicking on the like we. We'll, everybody can get a, can, can agree. Okay, climate change. I, unfortunately, I would say that the Republican politicians don't agree, but you know what? The majority of the country does, and these things, you know, so things that we can do bipartisan wise could definitely be, you know, climate change, green energy. Guess what? I would bet you that the majority of the United States would probably be okay if you told them, "Hey, let's get off foreign oil and <laughs> get and, off and oil." A big, a big, that's what a, you used even, to get it, off, right? Yeah, and and that's <laughs> and, and if they rephrased it, if they said it differently, like, let's get off Arabic oil. You could probably you could probably get all of the Trump supporters. So oh. I mean, we can we can slam this thing up in, in a kind of sort of racist way, but like I mean. Green energy, this is important, and if if I gotta if I gotta play the linguistics on it, I'll do that to try to get people interested in that. And then also, I mean, without a question, middle class growth, which is basically an indicator of how healthy a country is, like those three things: climate change, green energy, and middle class growth. I would think those three would be bipartisan. The way in which we get to them is a little bit different, but everyone should kind of want to sort of get those things good. And so, like, if we could concentrate on that and get back to that, that would be the contemporary politics. That's the stuff that's always going on. And I, I think that they have been lost in this party bickering that we run into now. Oh, yeah. I mean, yes. <laughs> I mean, there is very easy party bickering because everybody's bought by a lobbyist. I mean, that's the way it works. And yeah, and, and I, I'll be honest, I'm very anti lobbying. And maybe that's socialistic of me. Maybe it's libertarian of me. I don't I don't know what the fuck a term is, but. It's weird 
that we have that many groups that go and lobby things. And, and look, it's not getting done, right? We're, we talked about a girl that died of cancer tonight, and we're lobbying uh, over how much we should spend for climate change or where is the next oil going to come from. But they also got lobbies on the opposite side going, oh, we can't have abortions. Oh, let's take women's right away to do this. Or, oh, hey, let's stop. The Catholic Church doesn't have to provide contraceptive. I mean, for fuck sake exploded number three you, you we we can sit here all day long and, and negotiate lobbying and bitch about it and you know why i'm anti-lobbying is because we got people lobbying for bullshit things and no one's calling them out on it and and because it's tied to some personal thing they can't see past it and go okay hold on we got people dying of cancer over here by by the thousands and, and you want to worry about whether a, a, a woman can get birth control whether we should mandate the catholic church takes i don't know what a half a million dollars out of their multi-billion dollar industry tax-free yeah. for, for this? I mean, come on. What the, what the fuck is wrong with us? You know, like, and, and so when we look at that, what does that lead us to? That almost leads us to political parties collapsing on themselves, which we see in the RNC right now. We do. And, and it, it's like hollowed out parties is what you call it in the notes. You call it hollowed out parties. And it's an illusion. It's the emperor's new clothes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the um, it, it, it's people battling about things, lobbying and all that kind of stuff. What they've done is they've hollowed out the party. So the rest of the people, the people who aren't in office, all of the 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 real people who have to get up and go to a nine to five job, and they don't have to only work one hundred eighty dollars, one hundred eighty days a year, like all those fancy people in those special offices and in, in D.C. and whatever. They, I mean, we care about health care. We care about you know being able to take care of our families, and we care about care about all that stuff. But all of our political parties have been you know, essentially they've been evacuated of any of any kind of real substance. There's nothing there anymore. It's just who who's paying the most money? Okay, you got us. Whatever, we'll we'll back you up. Are you going to help us get elected? Are we going to win? Can we get our our you know our whatever published? Can we get our 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 specific you know, policy in, in, uh, enacted because we got in for the majority or whatever. What we've done is we've turned into almost like utilitarian type thing. We've lost the human element. We've lost what, you know, they always talk about like the, the foundational elements of what's important in this country. And it's like they wanted to protect people. They wanted to protect humanity. They didn't want people to become numbers and, and just get mowed over by a capitalistic monarchy whatever you know whatever the the oppressor would be that'd be taking away from the basic rights of the people and th- that's what this hollowed out party think this is a it's an awesome um blog uh basically on the uk and the reason i wanted to tie it in is because this guy is it, it hits close to home it hurts a little bit this is from a few years ago but uh it, it's very similar socioeconomic situations that we are in in the united states right now after seeing you know the brexit thing where people got pissed off the pendulum swung and it went a little further than people expected it to. So this this thing here, it started off with just like the major political parties are now empty vessels. And they're, it's, it says that um, it's an illusion without a backdrop, state buildings and major political parties that would, they're largely naked, empty forms, and their memberships are relatively tiny. Like if you look at the number of people who are registered for Democrat and Republican, and then look at the number of people who are registered as independents, we would really like to be involved as an independent. I have always been an independent, but we would really like to be involved in you know a lot of the selection for candidacy. But mm-hmm. as we've seen recently, that, that that gets a bit fishy when we only have a two party system and the independents don't get a say until the general election. Then you're picking you know the worst, the lesser of two evils. But the American problem is the same thing. Like it's always been a part of politics ever since the media revolution. So to the television revolution. And um, short-term thinking in politics is one of the side effects of, this, of democracy, having all those choices. And that's the big issue. Yeah. So that's the reason why I like this is the Amer- This is now the American problem. I don't know if you saw the the um, best of enemies. I believe it was called the Gore Vidal movie. Mm-hmm. Um, William Buckley and Gore Vidal. They they battled it out. It's on Netflix not too long ago. But um, that was something that was like that was the beginning of like the TV politics stuff and. We've shortened our time span, 24-hour news. Like, this is, it's gotten worse. This is the short-term stuff that our media has actually kind of adjusted or 
and change it's sound the way bites. we, the way we the, consume think about it. it. It's it's kind of, it's sound bites, right? You know, I mean, how yeah. many people actually read half the articles? There's scientific studies that show how many people really read the read the articles that are even they even share. And, and, and that's the thing is, you know, what politicians around you know three five years, sometimes more. You know, you know, look at the case of some judges; those fuckers are around forever. But you know, unfortunately, the fact is, is we don't change politicians fast enough for the time and, and the amount of money that goes into it, again, lobbying aspects, it, it's amazing. So politicians end up making promises to big business people who just contribute fucking money. Explosive number four. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, it, and it may be the politician's favorite policy, right? I mean, think about how many of those fuckers actually benefit from that, right? Those fuckers benefit so goddamn much. Explosive 17, for fuck's <laughs> sake. But they do. They, they, they benefit from this shit, right? They benefit from the fact... That they get free cars, they get, you know, paid vacations and all that that gibberish. And, and that's just the take thing. a look at the like the Clinton's net worth before when 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 uh when Bill was uh just a governor and then yeah, when they exactly. made, became presidents and started the Clinton Foundation and the money started rolling in, you know, from the Saudis for gun deals and stuff like that. Like there's a lot of stuff that gets fishy on this. It's, like one of the things we talked about on the show for legalization of marijuana and stuff, you, you basically said like, okay, toss about eight to ten million dollars, and you can get it legalized in your your state, plus or minus a, a few very variable factors or whatever. Like when it comes down to politics being how much money you got, that's the problem. Like that's the biggest issue for me. That's one of the reasons why like the short term stuff and the Hillary Clinton campaign stuff and the Citizens United stuff. Is, for me, my 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 central tenet of politics, the things that the biggest thing that I wanted to change, the most important one to me for the entire election cycle has been Citizens United and lobbying. I've been trying to get those out. If we can get those out, like that's a small step, and then we can concentrate a little bit further out from that. But that core thing there, removing big business lobbyists from you know the government, making and then going even further, possibly making all campaigns public funded. So each candidate has the same amount of money. So we have this weird equal playing field. Like all of these kinds of things are essentially are preventing big businesses from continuing to run the democratic process from behind the scenes. So yep. this this is the change we need to make. And this this short term stuff, this you know the media cycle stuff and lobbying and all of these you know what's the, what's the trending thing this week? That stuff affects our political process now. And I really would like people to pay more attention. And I would love if there was a bipartisan or tripartisan thing where everybody's like, you know what, this climate change thing is a big deal. If we could do, you know, concentrate everybody doing good things for those, and we'll nitpick for the rest of the stuff afterwards. That's fine. But I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm so tired of constantly battling just this weird short term. Like, how can we fix it in four years? You know what? You can't fix it in four years. I'm sorry, you cannot <laughs> fix the United States in four years. It doesn't matter if it's a Republican or it's like um, like Bernie always said before, you know, he endorsed Hillary. He said that you know this isn't about me; it's about the movement, and that's one of the things. Like people have been hammering so hard on Bernie for making a you know a compromise, a huge compromise, but a compromise. And in the end, really, it's going to be you know, will he get more of his things done, riding with you know the Democratic bandwagon? Let's hope, though, I guess, because he had a long term ideals out there. I guess that's basically the best, the most important thing about this that I can think of. So, yeah, and I agree with you. I think the more that we get, the more that we're able to move humanity forward, if that's what you want to call it, the better we're able to do that, the more shit we can get done. And, and my wife said something about six year presidential terms, one term, six years, nothing else. So we'll see. Maybe, maybe we'll do that segment later on. We got to get out of this segment because. In the next round, we get to talk science. <laughs> it's science, bitches. We'll be right back with more Cellar Door Skeptics. Hey, guys. This is Wyatt Mathers from the Atheist Avengers podcast. You are listening to the Cellar Door Skeptics. Prepare for the revolution. Hi, this is Dan, Ryan, and Matt with the Godless Revolution podcast. We've had a lot of great guests on this show. 
such as Russell Glasser, Dan Errol, Brian Fields, David Silverman, Doug Mesner, a.k.a. Lucian Greaves, and Joey Kirkman, whom we love a lot. We've also had a lot of really cool local guests. And we're a podcast that likes to fight for the separation of church and state and against anti-skepticism of all kinds. You should give us a listen, because if you don't, you're going to be really sad. Make your ears happy. Listen to the Godless Revolution podcast. If you guys like what you're hearing on Cellar Door Skeptic, please consider sponsoring us on our Patreon page. Our goal at Cellar Door Skeptic is to help promote more science, skepticism, secularism, and humanism in the world. We want to create better content for our podcast and for you, the listener, all while trying to help promote local activism. We're going to strive to make better podcasts, and I'll tell you what, we're even going to contribute some of the pro seeds to charity so please join us over at patreon forward slash cellar door skeptics to make sure that you sponsor us for as little as a dollar an episode thank you guys so much and prepare for the revolution this is deborah mctaggart from beyond the trailer park and you're listening to Cellar Door Skeptics. Look into the sky once again, I want to pray. I'm complaining the shit because I need to be alive. I've never seen the coming through the demons that I summon. I got reached by the dozen. I don't know what I'm becoming. <laughs> Welcome back to another <laughs> episode of Cellar Door Skeptics. <laughs> that epic, that intro's epic. I just, I love the band Order of Elijah. Now I don't, I don't know what to say. But we come we, back we to make talk. Him scream. About, we did make <laughs> him <laughs> scream once. We did, we did, we did do that. I should add that back into the show. I forgot all about that. But as we come back to the show, we we want to talk about science again, and we want to talk about how astronomers find. New evidence. Wow, Chris, what a <laughs> out running theme for science. You know, what I mean, it's it's amazing. Science. Wow, we somehow <laughs> <laughs> science. Sorry, I'm a little tired. Science does does find new evidence for things all the expletive time. They they do. And, yeah. and how about creationism, Chris? When's the last time creationism discovered something? I don't know. The last time they said that they found the ark, and then but they when didn't. was that? Then they didn't. But they, then didn't. they said they found it again, and they didn't. Then they said they found it again. They're like a fucking broken record. Yeah, I know. Expletive <laughs> record. They're, that's what it is. They're just. Yeah, why not? <sighs> I don't know. The, I don't know the, what else to say. They can walk around Mount Arafat for however long, Ararat, whatever, whatever the hell. But I mean, just cool. Go for it. You guys can keep digging in the rocks. So we'll, <laughs> we'll uh, we'll we'll keep searching the stars and everything for. The future for where humans can go after you, when you could care less about the environment and the planet decides to overheat and melt down, so we'll have a place to go. But like this, this story that we wanted to do for this thing, I was just flipping through the internet and it's essentially there, astronomers have found evidence of water clouds in the first spectrum of a cold brown dwarf. So like there's a bunch of science and words in there that are going to be a little bit goofy, but like spectrum is it's an important one that we've talked about well, in the past with uh. Um, a few of our astronomer friends that we had on the show with uh, Astronomy Saves the World. You should check it out. Can you remember how to say Dan? Dan's last Bachelador, name? Bachelador, motherfucker. Nope, nope. It is. It's, it's Bachelador. Bachel, like Satchel. Bachelador. <laughs> well, anyways, like the, the guys that are that are using these really, really powerful um, telescopes and stuff, they when, they when they're searching for something that isn't visible in the optical spectrum anymore, they use... Spectrum. They use spect- it's uh, spectroscopy, and uh, what it does is essentially it measures radiation intensity as a function of the wavelength. So they're looking at the wavelengths of the light that are coming back, and the way in which those wavelengths work and move and stuff. They can isolate what elements and what compounds, and so essentially what they're looking at is made out of. They use it on stars to find out what kind of stars they are, how old they are, what elements they are, because some stars, like our star, are essentially um, hydrogen and they're forming helium is the the first and the second uh, elements on the periodic table and and when they collapse and they crush themselves and then they make all super heavier 
elements, but like this kind of stuff, it, they can look at it using this uh, spectroscopy, and it'll tell them what they're looking at. Well, they're using that to look at the. This is the. It's the the closest thing outside of our solar system. It's a brown dwarf. It's na- known as Wise O eight five five. All right, and, all right. So I'm gonna stop you. What's a, what's a brown dwarf? Like I know what a dwarf is in 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 science terms. I know what a dwarf. Is. <laughs> And it's not, that came out wrong. Please don't crucify. That was nah, not I, my intention. Yeah, but I understand what, in terms of like a dwarf star, a dwarf planet is. But what does brown mean? What What is the significance with the color? A brown. Well, it's like the the brown is essentially that it's not really emitting anything. A brown dwarf is essentially a failed star, having formed the way stars do through gravitational collapse. You know, cloud or dust like that. Once they 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 start to there's a a a piece of meat in there that's got a gravitational amount and it starts to to coalesce whatever cloud uh, at the center of the solar system started to collapse, and then eventually it you know starts getting so massive that it starts to crush itself, and then it starts you know fusion and fission and all that kind of stuff. Well, this this is a, uh, a a star that didn't gain enough mass to spark that nuclear fusion reaction, just you know make the star shine. And so this is just a really 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 heavy monstrous piece of dirt <laughs> it's it's a really big heavy collection of dust and so like this the one that we're talking about is from uh we're, we're looking at the university of santa cruz is uh the website that this is on and it's in the it's in the links but uh this one is about five times the mass of jupiter so it's, it's a big it's a big you know brown dwarf as far as like i guess that we when we consider anything in our in our solar system but uh it, it it's really it's, it's kind of like a, a a gas giant planet in many respects. And so its temperature is at a certain temperature. It's, it's minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit roughly. And so it's, it's relatively, what is that in, in American terms? Sorry. Well, minus 10 Fahrenheit is the American standard. Like 250, oh, so, so 250 Kelvin. Is I see. So it's, people. it's, it's less than 10. It's, it's 10 degrees below zero. Yeah. It's, it, okay. it, it's like Canada. Holy shit. It's, it's like Canada. Yeah, it's like Canada. <laughs> Keith. I guess. <laughs> we'll to, Where all the hockey plays. We'll, we'll have to ask Keith what the temperature is. <laughs> yeah. Keith, if you're listening to this right now, Keith, please send a message to cellardoorskeptics at gmail.com and make sure you tell <laughs> us how fucking cold it is right now. <laughs> well, I mean, there are friends over at Not Another Atheist Podcast, and if, if they're cold, if their internet wires have defrosted enough so they can send emails out again, that will, uh, I mean, they can, they can, we can talk about being minus 10 Fahrenheit, but this, this brown dwarf, it's, it's the first opportunity that we have had as, you know, a human race to study an extra solar planetary mass object that's nearly as cold as our own gas giant. So it's, it's not in our solar system. Essentially, it's not gravity, uh, connected to our sun, but this is an object that we're able to study now. Our technology has advanced far enough that we can look at it and we can kind of sort of get a good idea. It's really, really, really far away. But um, the biggest thing is that they, when they studied it, they studied it for 13 nights in about a 14-hour period of time. And they, they gathered all of this infrared spectrograph. But it's only like 5% of what, we're really, like what we usually get for, for infrared stuff. So, it's really, so really, really why big. is that, though? Because it's so far away. It's okay, a- so it's just because it's really that far away. <laughs> yeah, man. Like, uh, we, we, is it is it farther away than it would take to get back to the beginning of the new or the Old Testament? Oh, in light years? Yeah, mm, probably not. Because light goes uh, pretty quick. Well, man. you know, maybe the maybe Adam and Eve are more correct than this star is an illusion. <laughs> maybe you took too much acid. I don't know. I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know that that uh, was in the Garden of Eden too. But technically, if God made the everything, the mushrooms were anima, anima that was was, That's why they were talking to the snake, man. Exactly. Anyway, sorry. It could be. Well, either way, like this. This is you know what they've got when they got the infrared stuff back. The important thing here is that you know, at that temperature, we've got weird clouds of water vapor in the spectroscopy spectroscopy that you know they're like, okay, well, we know what's on this on this particular thing there's you know it's like a gassy planet it's got a gassy outer layer and it gets harder and you know more solid and whatever in the middle well there's a thing called phosphine and what they usually use is they they measure phosphine and the abundance of phosphine usually tells how uh, turbulent this type of you know gassy large uh planet or you know this uh 
the, the brown dwarf. So I, I, not you know the, a, a cold star. And so like the, the phosphine they used to measure is what they used to tell whether or not it's really, really turbulent or whatever. Well, phosphine on the, the reading on the brown uh, dwarf is very low. And so that means that it's, it's calm, pretty relaxed. And, and Jupiter is it's high. It's much higher. So it's like much more turbulent, much more crazy. And so like what, the, what they've basically been able to do is they're like, okay, there's, there's water. There's something a long, long ways away. Outside of our solar system, we found water. And like we always talk about, one of the most important things about human life, about life in general, biological life, is the fact that water is the necess- it's the necessary component. So I mean, if we're finding this stuff, it's just one step out of our solar system, at least we're still finding it out there. And it's not like this, you know, incredibly, incredibly impractical combination of, of biology and chemistry. Maybe we are looking at potential, you know, you know, first places for life and things of that in the future outside of our solar system just makes it a little bit less likely that we are the only ones. And so then what we would say is, are we, are we not alone? Are we the chosen people? We're not, but are we not alone, Hannah? I, I would say that we're not alone, but I don't know if we would say that I, that it's, it's all, um, we are the only intelligent life, but I would say that if there is intelligent life in the universe, it's probably scattered so far away that the, um, uh, the Fermi paradox holds true that we're so far away that we would never actually be able to interact with each other because where we, div- the Fermi paradox basically means that, that life can evolve relatively commonly across the universe, but the universe is so big that we're so far away that by the time it would take for us to travel, considering light as the speed limit of the universe for us to travel and actually communicate with each other would be so long that the entirety of humanity would have come and gone. And so, like, where are all the people? Is the Fermi paradox? If this, if life can form all over the universe and it continues to get smarter and smarter and smarter, where are all the people? Well, this is just a nice little bit of information that could potentially maybe solve the Fermi paradox. It talks one about day. the building blocks. I mean, if you relate yeah. it to what we did last week, right? We talked about building blocks. I mean, that's what we were doing. Is we're laying foundations or trying to help people understand the foundation of things. And and I. This one, this this article. I mean, and they do. They talk about, and, and it's amazing, right? It's a dead star, <laughs> you know. It's a it's a, it's a star that failed. That's helping to create some sort of building blocks to life. And, and if we if we look at and, and you read through the article, they say the spectrum allows us to investigate dynamical and chemical properties that have long been studied in Jupiter's atmosphere, but this time on an extrasolar world. And that's what's amazing about this, right? It's, it's so it, cool. we're seeing similar things. And, and what do we talk about in evolution? What what is one of the big predictability? Things? Exactly. Yeah. And that's the big thing here is that we're seeing more occurrences, and the better our technology gets, the more we can see it. And, and I'll, I'll be honest if if we if we never discover other life, I'm still okay with it. I still could die happy, and in the end, you know, what's my death, right? I mean, I'm not going to be, I'm not moving into a new life, right? <laughs> you know, but but for if me... We have a, if we have a, um, a transhumanist or something, maybe we'll have... Maybe, you're right, maybe, maybe that we'll would, have, that would work. Know, perpetual life by the time you're old and creepy or something. <laughs> old and creepy, fuck you. But the big thing here is that we're seeing reoccurrences of similar things. And, and, and please, please go back and check out the last episode... Ignore the Brexit part if you don't want to get into the politics <laughs> side of it. The science epic, its science segment was fucking epic. It just, it just, it, it was out of this world. And yeah, I'm biased towards evolution. I fucking love talking about fucking evolution. I just do. It's like one of my favorite things to talk about, honestly. But that's the big thing here is this is a, a, a small, not symptom, but like a small reoccurrence of physics of science you know. yes in, are- in evolution we're seeing evolutionary properties come to life through this article and we can go aha <laughs> you know and i just i don't know and maybe i'm getting overexcited maybe maybe what i'm bit. asking for fuck you maybe <laughs> what i'm asking for is more than that but i get excited when i'm not not only that i'm able to disprove theists in their origins of life stories but because of the fact that we're looking for answers and we're starting to find them and that's exciting yeah, just, finding just new learning life is exciting. Is awesome. Just yeah. learning anything, it's awesome. I the, one of the cool things about this study, it, it, it says it in the article, is that they they ran different simulations and they they predicted models saying um, that there would be you know 
um, different assumptions. So including the cloudy and cloud free models. Like what I was talking about earlier is like dirt, certain temperatures and certain makeups for the brown dwarf would have clouds and would not have clouds. So it'd be cold, and, you know, essentially atmosphere free, blah, blah, blah. All of that, all of that stuff they put into their, their simulation. So they had this, this wallet, this, this, you know, research packet of information that they used to, uh, to try to figure out, you know, what are the possibilities? And so they did all the math and they said, okay, we did experimental data. Here's what, here's what, um, basically supported our, our, our predictions. And then we measured it with the experimental data and confirmed our prediction. And that's the one we're going to go with until the next measurement. And so that's how science works. That's the best part. It's like, you're, you could have predicted moonshine and, and unicorns and, and Noah who floated his boat all the way to the brown dwarf. <laughs> but until evidence confirms that theory, then it's, you know, nothing. It's the hypothesis at best. And so this is just more information. It's really cool they're finding water vapor and stuff like that. That that really what I wanted to do is just get people interested in the fact that they're able to actually track and measure planetary type uh, monstrosities. This is a huge this is a huge beast outside of our solar system, and they can they can look at it and see it now. And, and I agree, and I'm excited, and I can't wait till we do next week's science segment because Hannah's going to find another article very <laughs> similar to this, and he always does. But as we as we leave this segment, uh, please go click the links, go find other research, suggest things to us. Say, hey, Chris squared, we want to read about this, right? That's and and we we're a little. Wrong. We're on a little bit of a NASA rant lately, but just appreciate it. Because when we come back, we're going to talk about conservative horseshit (laughs) on immigration and welfare. We'll be right back with more Cellar Door Skeptics. This is Ishmael Brown, the H&IC from the Angry Black Rant Podcast, and you're listening to the Cellar Door Skeptics. Hi, my name's Callie. And I'm Ari. If you're like most of us, you're very concerned about the gay agenda's plans for world domination. Are you tired of seeing glitter all over every damn thing? Do you hate rainbows as much as any other red-blooded American? Then we have the answer for all your baseless fears and unjustified paranoia. Presented exclusively on Secular Media Network, the Gaytheist Manifesto is your source for news, commentary, discussion, and debate at the intersection of the atheist movement and the LGBT rights movement. You can find us on Spreaker, iTunes, and at gaytheistmanifesto.secularmediagroup.com. If you're not ready to get in line for your mandatory gay marriage and you're terrified of short-haired women in pantsuits, Come have a listen and get up to date on their plans. You'll be glad you did. Like what you're hearing? Check out more Cellar Door Skeptics every week right here on Spreaker and iTunes. Make sure you come back and check out new episodes with your hosts, Christopher Tanner and Chris Hanna. And always remember, prepare for the revolution. This is Trav Mamone, host of the By Any Means podcast, and you're listening to Cellar Door Skeptics. Prepare for the revolution. We have cookies. Now, back to the show. We have the class clink, clink. You can hear it. And the drop on the table. Down the hatch. Ah, welcome back to Cellar Door Skeptics. For those drinking to the show <laughs> and playing the drinking game, every time we say the word amazing. I think that's the first one. Nope. Fourth. You're go back me. and listen. Anyway, any of those listening, go back and listen. Every time I say amazing or Hannah says amazing, we're going to do a shot. <laughs> so by the end of the show, if you count how many amazing have been said in the freaking yard, you'll know how drunk Hannah is because he can't hold his liquor for shit. I'm a little bastard. I can't he help is. it, man. But we got to talk 
about conservative bullshit. bullshit. And bullshit. it's funny, in, in our notes, in our notes for this segment, Hannah has this thing called douchey article. Oh, God. <laughs> it's Zero. called douchey article. You literally, you literally <laughs> wrote that on the notes. Like, if I were, like, a t- if I were reading a teleprompter right now, like, you know, Ron Burgundy from, you know, Anchorman, like, I'd be uh, like, add a question douchey mark. Article? <laughs> really? Yeah. I'm Over Ron... $2,400 a week? I'm Ron Burgundy? Like, <laughs> if you put a question mark there, he will say it. Uh, he no. will, yeah. like, th- basically, this is a Zero Hedge article. And I was flipping through the internet, through Reddit, through Facebook, through whatever I was browsing through, and someone put on there that that uh, immigrants cost us two plus billion dollars a oh, year. Oh, who said that? That's insane. You know what who the said, fuck? You know, that, yeah, I know. That's who, why who I, would say that? You know who said it? Tyler Durden said it. What? No. That, that's what this oh. idiot who writes <laughs> on Zero Head, he calls himself <laughs> so Tyler, Tyler Durden. Durden. Uh, no, because Tyler oh. Durden's a fictional character. I know he is. But either way, Tyler Durden was significantly Jackass. cooler than this asshole. Because he put dick pics in, in movies for children, I guess. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> well, either way, no, this this immigration one is the one that really bugs me. And so what he does is he plays numbers. And he plays numbers in a way in which if you twist them, hey, guess what? My first read through, I was like, wow, you know what? Those numbers don't lie because I understood the math that I ran that he ran through. But as I... um read through the article a second and a third time, and then I started smashing things. The biggest thing is that his assumptions, when it comes to math, we talked about it a little while ago, is like assumptions and mathematics and story problems and big situations, you make assumptions about whatever you're calculating. So his assumptions for calculating these amounts of money that immigrants cost the United States are absurd beyond absurd. So flipping through the article, the what really triggered you know my rage. It says the the, the whole thing. <laughs> the picture. Come on, I'm sorry, dude. The picture. Look what? at the look at the fucking picture. Like I'm so, illegal immigrants. And hold on, let's blow that picture up. It's a bunch of Mexicans on they're, a fence. No, dude, they're not even Mexicans. They're black people. That's the insane part. Look at this. Oh, yeah. Look at the picture. It's not even an actual well, you see the, fucking picture. If, 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 you go to the, if you go to the article, there's, <laughs> I'm going to say about 10, maybe 12, what appears to be African Americans. And there's a <laughs> cop in riot gear sitting on the fence, but like they're in between their legs. So it's like straddling the fence. And then there's another cop in riot gear on like a ladder. It's just a terrible <laughs> but, image. But hold on. So, anyways, it, but it, Hannah, Hannah, any article that says it's an economic issue, plain and simple, like, and then they highlight it, like, here, please click this link. It, and there's on, no like, link. There's no click. There is, it, you're right. It's not. Yeah. It, it's a plain. They underline link, it, but there's no link. I tried. I tried it like uh, <laughs> uh, in a bunch of places throughout this article. It was underlined, and so I just assumed it was a link, and I found myself clicking to no avail. Okay, but anyways. Just to the meat of the article, to the most important part, what, they, what they're what they doing is they're calling out, uh, It's a, they're saying that there's a scam that people are working. And David North of, of CIS.org, you can look at it if you want. I, I flipped through it. It's just, it's you don't too, want to. No. it's garbage. You'll shit your pants. You'll be like, fuck No, this. it's it's just, it, essentially it's like a, uh, it's an echo chamber. So you go to a website that's an echo chamber for people who don't like immigration. Um, but this one says that the, the The whole argument here is that, you know, an all-citizen family of three people, employed father, stay-at-home mother, and a small child. The dad makes $2,400 a month. The family's income is too high for food stamps since the minimum monthly income is $2,177 for a family of three. But then next door is there's a mixed family, also three people, the father being the only worker, also earning $2,400 a month. The difference is that the father is an ineligible alien, and so under many states' regulations, one-third of the family's income is ignored. So, essentially, leaving the family with a nominal income of $1,600 a month that allows the family to get food stamps, you know, allotment for uh, the two citizens, but not for all three in the family. But thus, the you know, the band of household incoming is uh, $2,177 a month. At the bottom, they're making twenty five eighty nine a month, which would be... Now, eligible for food stamps because they have the extra money from the father who doesn't actually get claimed. So the wage on the wage earner and everybody is an alien in the eyes of the USDA. All citizens household in this band would not be eligible for food stamps. But in the end, what they're doing, they're saying that uh, 150 percent of what the, uh, the the two people in that uh, that mixed house 
is uh, they're getting you know a bunch of extra money. So 30, 33% discount on the illegal's wages. That right there, just for that $2,400 a month thing, like, okay, the illegal immigrant, someone who has no documented papers, who is making $2,400 a month. Are you familiar with how much how much people make on minimum wage? <laughs> yeah, it ain't twenty four hundred dollars a month. <laughs> You're damn right, it's not. And that's what I. That's my first thought. I was like, okay, you should what? be skeptical of just that. Like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but illegal immigrants who can't go get jobs at like Steel Case or Herman Miller or my not even Meyer, but like uh, I don't know what's another manufacturer, Ford or GM. Just any manufacturing they can't place get a, or whatever. They can't, they can't, they can't, oh my well, god! But even then, like, what, do you think that immigrants? This is are irritating. Get, do you think Im- immigrants are trying to get jobs at like major manufacturing places? They're going to no, because they don't want the to get exported. Yeah, the, the least deported. paperwork places they can possibly find. So, well, essentially, what I did when I read that and I got frustrated and I said, "Okay, well, what's minimum wage? Seven dollars and twenty five cents an hour. That's." For forty hour a week, that's two hundred and ninety dollars a week. That's gross pay. No taxes taken out here. For a four week month, which, you know, roughly twenty days, but I just I just uh rounded to uh you know four week month. That's eleven hundred and sixty dollars a month. Yeah. Okay. That's that a is, lot different that's than twenty four hundred dollars. Of that twenty four hundred. Exactly. Now, I, <laughs> on top of that, so you're saying that this guy, Tyler Durden, Captain Douchebag, Tyler Durden, is saying that illegal immigrants, people who have no papers, no you know paperwork to get a decent job in this country, they're making fourteen to fifteen dollars an hour. That's what he's saying in this article. That's the only way that happens. I guarantee you. I guarantee you that number, the number of illegal immigrants that are making fourteen to fifteen dollars an hour, is so freaking small that it's absurd. It, it, it's a statistical zero. Well, well, hold on, hold on, because your notes say twenty four hundred dollars a week. Is that incorrect? It should be a month. Yeah, okay, it should okay. be a month. All right, all right, because twenty four hundred dollars a week, a week is paid, sixty dollars an hour, and yeah. that's insane to me. That's, that, that's, that's like. So that yeah so okay so fair enough so it's fifteen bucks a week or uh, fifteen yeah. bucks an hour and, and that's that's a fair wage that's yeah, that's, that's what they're pay. claiming are, are you sure they didn't just go hmm HillaryClinton.com. dot com yeah maybe BernieSanders dot com well they would have had to go to Bernie wage. first they would have had to go to Bernie first and then they would have gotten like oh wait that's right Hillary appropriated oh, the, uh, oh, the New York thing oh, when they found it oh, yeah but no. all right any. Yeah. <laughs> Stop the re- <laughs> stop moving the goalposts, Chris Hanna. Well, either way, but so- but hold on, hold on though. So so they're claiming they're claiming this extra- extravagant amount of money, mm-hmm. and then they're claiming that people are paying welfare based on this, and it's they're 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 claiming people are stealing money. Yeah, is what they're basically. doing. And and well, I'll be how about this? Hold on, I have a story. I actually have a story that relates to this because yeah. I worked Didn't for you a, have co- a neighbor or something. What? You had a neighbor that was getting a bunch of uh, I I. They weren't getting a bunch of money. I can tell you that. They were no. poor as fuck. Okay. Yeah, I, okay. So I have two stories, technically. Technic- yeah, you're right. When I lived in Wyoming, I had some uh, Wyoming, Michigan. I had some neighbors, and there was, I don't know, like three families living in one house, three bedroom, no upstairs, small backyard, and a full size finished basement, right? Sure doesn't sound like an extravagant twenty four hundred dollar no. a month father and, of three. <laughs> and they worked on their cars. How about this? Hannah, they did nothing but try and fix their cars. Literally, like on the weekends, they would have cars up on jacks. They'd yeah. be doing whatever they had to do with them. They weren't I don't think they were even doing this for profit. I think literally no. all of that was just their family's car- cars. Yeah. And but hold on, that's not the actual story I have. And you're right, that's that's very true. I live next to yeah, you. We and they were nice on a people. Full tangent on cars. They, they, <laughs> we could, seriously. We could. But, but hold on. When I worked at a company called Witness Inspection, yeah, I'll drop their name because I think they illegally pay people. We had a oh, lot man. of women that worked for us, a lot of Hispanic women, seriously. And they paid them less than nine dollars an hour and yes i'm calling you out because the two of you <laughs> fucking assholes live in zealand michigan oh man right now yeah sure here? literally dude we could walk to their house from my house that's how close they live now but hold on the best part about this is they were paying each other seventy five thousand 
thousand dollars a piece for their salary for owning the company, right? And that doesn't sound like a lot. That's pretty reasonable. You own a company, you make seventy five thousand dollars. That's a that's a reasonable salary compared to five hundred k, six hundred k, seven hundred k. That it. yeah, I would take it. I'm Holy sure you crap, would. I own my own company. I don't make seventy. No, you don't. <laughs> and neither do I. But we we make shit. We make less than seventy five combined. Yeah. But the the difference is though with this couple, they paid their car payments out of this. Their company, they paid. I literally she. They literally had a breakdown of their expenses and what the company covered. They were able to donate over twenty fucking thousand dollars a year to their fucking church. Hannah, that's how much liquid cash they had. Well, and, that's, that's that's the ten percent tithing. I mean, yeah. twenty grand—that's a pretty big ten percent. Yes, and so that was the thing. They they had the money. Their company had the money, but yet they paid the majority of the employees crap. And I'll be honest, and and, and this is I don't want to get off on a social justice tangent be, because that's where I'm headed with this. Yes, you're of. you're on, you're off. You you already, am, took, but, you already left. But look, <laughs> I made seventeen bucks an hour as a white male compared to the average yeah. employee that made nine dollars an hour. I was making almost double, and I didn't make shit for what I did, but I almost made double what the average employee made at that company. And I'm not saying, hey, take my salary and give it to someone else, right? I'm not saying that. But I am saying that a company that can afford to pay their employees nine bucks an hour for the majority of them, they're like, oh, we got one supervisor, 17 bucks. I mean, I just, you look at them and you look at how rich they are and they, how they can, they don't even bat an eye. And yeah, I worked with a family that literally couldn't feed all the children in it. They had to get food stamps. And guess what? You know what they were doing for me? They appreciated me helping them stay employed because I fought for them in, in a couple of tricky situations. They gave me lasagna. They made yeah. me lasagna. They made me food when they made half what I made, and they were struggling to feed their kids, and yet they honored me as an individual. And I'm like, hey, I'm sorry. I can't take this. And they're like, you have to. And so yeah. I took it, you know, and I enjoyed it. And, well, and then course. I bought them all lunch, you know, for a couple of weeks in a row just because <laughs> I felt bad for them. But I sit there and I look at that, and you go, what the fuck? It's eco- well, economic injustice. And those are the people, Hannah. Those are the people uh, that read this article and go, yep, guess what? That's right. Immigrants are taking billions of dollars from us. Yeah, I know. Uh, it's just, it's, it's such a hurtful thing. Really, in the end, like the, the greatest thing that the richest people and the most powerful people in this country ever did was convince us to hate and fight with each other. Like, the hate and fight with people make a little bit less than you, or vice versa, that people make a little bit more than you, they're the one that are subjugating you, not the big guys way up on the totem pole. And so, uh, that situation, I, my, my next door neighbors, last weekend, they, they had a birthday party, and they didn't have to invite me over. They invited me over, and literally, they could not stop handing me things. Like, do you want food? Are you not happy? Or do you not have as much food as you can possibly have? Do you not have as much... <laughs> You don't have as much beer as you can possibly handle. I, I I absolutely went back to my house and just passed out. Like these people are the most. It's a good thing you could walk and not drive because oh, we don't man. advocate drinking and driving. Okay, on this no, show. they 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 absolutely they were amazing. There, so, <laughs> so it was a pretty good party. And the, the the guy's birthday party it was just a, a riot. But that's that's the experience I've had in my entire life. Every single time with you know immigrants with people that are from different countries that come here and they bust their ass and they're absolutely wonderful, amazing people. And then I hear on the other end, you know, I see it on TV. It's like, it's the immigrants. It's the, they're thieves. They're stealing, blah, blah, blah. It's no, they're not. They're not. These people are not this, this villain that you make them out to be American media. Like we have a, a series of links in this one because I I had to get link heavy on this for finding you did, support you, you stuff. You slapped no, you have the fuck to. out of me with well, links. Well, the immigration thing is a really important topic. Like a lot of people have talked about it, so I wanted to get a variety of things. Like Slate specifically says immigration artics, uh, critics argue you know the poor unskilled workers legally you know throng our shores and riverbanks, blah blah blah. Then um it, it's the benefits are showered upon them. They come here and we just give them everything. Well, that's the big thing that you know we've been told it's like you can just come here and just get all the benefits all you want as soon as it, all you have to do is get over the border and then you get everything you get all of the things well they they did neglect to mention that um 
The U.S. economy couldn't function without the vast armies of foreign-born foreign born workers willing to work, you know, in the tough industries for low wages. So there's a Morgan Spurlock episode of uh, one of his uh, documentary shows that they talk about, like, how difficult it is to, to be, you know, an orange picker in, you know, southern states or whatever. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's insane. Exactly. And I worked, okay, I worked for a farmer, right? I actually had to pick tomatoes in a greenhouse, right? You? I did as a kid. I picked tomatoes. And as a kid, I, okay. As a as kid, kid. slave no, I'm fat cool. now. I don't fucking do that. But, <laughs> but, 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 but no, seri- in all seriousness, though, you're right, though. I mean, it's, it's insane. It's insane the shit that people had to go through to make fucking money for their family. And it's, a, yeah. it's like, it's like they're, instinctively taking evolutionary traits and taking the worst parts of them to, you know, do what they got to do to make money. And, you know, my farmer wasn't rich. I'll be honest. The guy I worked for was not rich at all. But I guarantee you, he, in my opinion, that's slave labor. And I'm sorry. Well, but I some no, nobody. You. I hate to break it to you, but evolution isn't this nice and warm and fuzzy thing that we all make it out to be. It's cold and heartless. You, which you're is, right. But which that doesn't is exactly make it right, like though. capitalism. Okay, fair enough. I'll grant, <laughs> I'll grant you that, Hannah. I hate campalism yeah, probably as much as you do. And but you're you're right. But they're not unskilled people. The problem no. becomes is the fact that they do whatever it takes to survive. It's what they're doing. And I literally, I worked my, the farmer I worked with. They were in partner with an apple farm, right? They had cabins with plumbing and electricity built into them, built on the premise for these families. And I, I, we, we were picking apples one year, right? And dry, and we're driving by and one of the things picking apples. And I literally walked out and I said, holy shit, how many people are in that little house? Well, it's a one bedroom house. Yeah. How many people are in there? 15. What? How is that legal? Well, they choose to do this and they send money back because in the end, the U S is more lucrative than the, the country that they come from. And, and we should get into this topic because Even- I am pretty anti NAFTA. I'm aggressively anti-NAFTA. I'm aggressively. I'm, it's not that I don't want to support other countries because that's a pretty socialistic, you know, topic, right? It's not yeah. all about us. It's about the world. But at some point, at some point, I, I do stop and I say, "Hold the fuck on." We have people. Explicit number seventeen and a half. We have people here at home, right? And the, and the, and and we have people starving and people living in the streets, and we're sending we're sending jobs overseas. For shit wages to bring yeah. them back on no taxes because it benefits the world. Well, hold on. To me, that seems like a misnomer, right? That almost seems like a delu- illusion. Let's pull the curtain back and say, yeah, go to China. How many of those people are living good lives? Yeah. What's their suicide rate compared to ours? <laughs> yeah. I, I bet. I bet. It, I bet it's double. The um the big thing with the 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 trade uh, agreements or whatever is that what we're doing is we're making the American worker compete with you know really 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 drastically low wages with other people in all other countries i mean you can you can't uh, americans c- can't compete with thailand wages you just can't do it so like these these uh, trade agreements that's what they're doing they're forcing us to fight with those people to fight against that stuff and so like you know the, what we were talking about for all of the different myths and stuff with um with all the illegal immigration like they don't pay any taxes. Bullshit. We've got a, a CNN money article saying that they paid ten point six million to the state and local taxes in two thousand ten. So I guarantee you, it's even higher now. Like, what? Yeah, it's That's insane. Yeah, it's like we have massive payments just in California alone. Two point two billion dollars go into the state of California from illegal immigrants who to get illegal paperwork or whatever, and so they're putting their money into the system. They. They do pay taxes, but the only thing they don't do, they don't get any payback out. Yeah, we they, put our they money get in. Yeah, we put our money in Social Security. We put our money into taxes, and guess what? We get a little bit of payback. These people are just trying to stay alive. They're just trying to stay in this country. They get whatever they can, however they can. They get a job, and they put taxes in. And they legitimately, it says in here that they 6.4% of their income at least and they said that 50 to 75% of about 11 million unauthorized U.S. immigrants file and pay income taxes every year. I mean, 50 to 75%. So this is a large piece of that illegal immigrant group that they're saying it's not paying taxes. Well, guess what? They are. And they, on top of that, you know, they're never going to get that money out. Like, how many illegal immigrants do you think are going to file for their Social Security when they're 65? 
How many of them? I mean, the, yeah, this I, is. This I don't is, know. I ho- I hope, Hannah. And, well, and how we, would you? How would you? <clears throat> that, that's well, hold the thing. on. I think I think we should actually. I'll be honest. This is a great topic. Yeah, and I'm excited. Uh, you got me fucking fired up. You know bitches. what? That's not and, good. <laughs> that's not yeah. good. But so we got we do we got to go take a, we're going to take a quick commercial break, and then when we come back, we're actually going to finish with this because I have something more to say about. The 11 million unauthorized immigrants that will not receive Social Security. I have a problem with this, and I want to have a conversation about it. So what we're going to do is we have to. We have to take a quick commercial break. We have to. We the do. forces that be. They do. <laughs> Fuck you, the forces that be. What are you, from <laughs> Star Wars now? You know, the force no. be with you, I was actually you, thinking, I'm thinking more of like a totalitarian dictatorship of Tanner and Hell's Bowl. <sighs> that's, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. <laughs> but we, we're going to take a quick commercial break. Remember, go support Team Tiny Dancer at GoFundMe.com forward slash Team Tiny Dancer. Make sure you go support everything they do. And when we come back, we're going to have more political discussion on Hannah's, Hannah's desire to try and figure out the 11 million immigrant income decrease every year. We'll be right back with more Cellar Door Skeptics. Hello, I'm Miss B. Haven. I'm Demanda Wright. And we're promoting Promoting secular secular feminism. And And you're listening to Cellar Door Skeptics. Hmm. What's something I could do with a very sexy lady friend of mine that people would find provocative, interesting, and entertaining enough to tune in week after week? Hmm. Oh, I know. A podcast. If you'd like to hear me and Kate be provocative and thought-provoking week after week, join us on the Unbuckling the Bible Belt podcast. We'd love for you to be part of our audiological three-way. Looking for something new and exciting? Or maybe just a change from the old atheist show format? Cellar Door Skeptics Podcast provides listeners with hours of enjoyment each week on Spreaker and iTunes. Check us out as we talk politics, religion, science, reviews of books and music, along with the occasional interview just for a twist. Join Christopher Tanner and Chris Hanna every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern as they bring fresh content to you. Walk with us through the cellar door as we help you prepare for the revolution. You can find us on Spreaker, iTunes, YouTube, and even on Facebook. Hey, this is Keith. And this is Jen, and we're from Not Another Atheist Podcast. You're listening to Cellar Door Skeptics. Join the revolution. You'll hear the clink of the glass and the sound of the table and the final shot for the evening. That was very churchy. It was. That's like a um, <sighs> some kind of weird Fuck. tradition thing where like we uh, we I don't know <laughs> succumb to the uh, the powers and the evil. We, nature we, we our... haven't succumbed to anything <laughs> but the desire to toast a fallen comrade. Yeah. But we got to get back into the immigration thing because I got fired up, right? And and yeah, normally we'd be like, hold on, we're going to end the segment. How, hold on, Hannah, hurry up, shut the fuck up so we can move on. No, blah, blah, we got blah, more. Blah. We just got more. You, you were like 17 pages to this one. But let's go back to the 11 million unauthorized immigrants that are not going to receive social security benefits. That's just insane to me. That's insane. There's yeah. going to be 11 million people in the United States. that are going to have to suffer because they're probably not millionaires <laughs> and they're going to suffer for this. And that's insane to me. That's just utterly insane that we would allow that in society. 
Well, the truth is that undocumented immigrants contribute more in payroll taxes than they'll ever consume in public benefits. So the biggest thing here is that, you know, they're putting money into the tax system. They are, and they're they're putting more in, even in the illegitimate ways in which they actually get, you know, jobs and get a full in. Uh, they have taxes pulled out, payroll taxes and everything. They uh, They take Social Security, for example, according to the Social Security Administrator, SSA, Unauthorized immigrant, which are who are not eligible to receive Social Security benefits, they have paid in an eye-popping one hundred billion dollars, billion, in uh, to it into the fund in the last decade. So in the last ten years, illegals who will never actually benefit from the Social Security money they put in have put in one hundred billion dollars, an estimate from the actual Social Security Administration. So this these are the people who are in charge of the social security system. So uh, they're paying in an estimated $15 billion a year in social security with no intention of ever collecting the benefits. You know why? Because they want to be Americans and they're trying to escape problematic regimes. And we're, we're going to go into this in the future. I've been doing research and I haven't completed it, but the United States and Latin America's horrible, horrible, you know, foreign policy, but like so, these people so are, are you, trying to escape these really horrible situations. You, you're and right, but hold on. Let's talk about here. the wall. Can we talk about the wall a second? No, why we not? can't talk about the wall because the wall's stupid. Okay, but why? <laughs> let's let's. So, <laughs> I've spent a lot of time with Jeremiah, <laughs> and we've talked about the wall a little bit. Are you going to pay for the wall? I'm not going to pay for the fucking wall. You Andy. might have to if you pay taxes. Well, I'll tell you what, for the, I don't know, 11 million people that are going to lose $100 billion in funding for their, you know, not ability to retire. Well, High Chancellor the, Trump the, is going to kick him out of the country as soon as he gets in office. You know that, right? Yeah. But, <laughs> Where's that money going to go? The, well, they're, all their money's <laughs> gone. And all those jobs are going to go, which is going to raise pay rates. Also, we're, we saw we talked about with the fast food industry, but hold on. So the wall's going to affect this aspect right here because they're going to put a wall up. Do you feel, and this is maybe a more of a personal question, but do you feel honestly that more immigrants, if Trump got in, built a wall, will more immigrants still want to come in to continue to not collect Social Security? I mean, let's look at the cost value. If they're making 4 bucks an hour versus, in Mexico, 2 bucks an hour, and that other $2 an hour allows them to survive for the rest of their life, if we look at that, are they still going to continue to come even with the wall? And then at that point, the wall was a waste of money because they're still coming in. It's not deterring them. Well, what we've seen most recently, we've seen a cons- basically a, a stagnation in the number of immigrants. And you can see this in some of the links that we have included. We have not seen an increase. We've actually seen a, a steady, basically, uh, equalization or a decrease in the number of immigrants that are coming in the United States. The, the Mexican immigrants. And what we've seen is an increase in uh, people from like Ecuador and uh, other countries further south towards, you know, the Central Americas. They're coming up through Mexico. And it's, it's in the end, really, and it's, it's not going to make that big of a difference. Like, build a wall or whatever. Like, there's no way that you can, like, they, they've talked about it. You can't build a wall over, like, certain areas and certain geographic <laughs> locales like you just can't do it and so in the end you know you're alienating an, enc- an entire um uh voting group a uh, voting block in the, in the country and but well, let's think of just it like hope this that too. they don't well, well think of it like this well, i work for a very large company what do they do they exported a whole plant of thousands of people down to mexico right because it was yeah. cheaper labor but think about what that does right that employs more people. They're probably going to pay them a little bit more because that's what happened in America. They pay them a little bit more than a living wage so they can start spending money, get farther in debt, create a new cycle of income, right? Which will grow and it'll do the same thing the United States did. So, you know, you were paying two bucks an hour before. Now they're paying four fifty an hour down there. Uh, so, so they've, you're, they've doubled. You're basically, you're making an assumption that like those countries or whatever that were like, we're sending money But I'm, I'm not making the an assumption. There. The statistics show this, Hannah. Well, no, no, what I we mean had is. this discussion at, at my work the other day. This is actually a valid thing. That what's happening is we move these jobs to Mexico, right? In, a, in an and effort to save up. millions of dollars. They save millions of dollars, but five, six, seven years later, they're no longer saving that amount of money because they're funneling more money into Mexico. There's more money to be had. 
and more people are spending money. And what's happening is they're seeing the same thing that happened in the U.S., right? We took an economy and we escalated it through the Industrial Revolution. They're having a mini Industrial Revolution in Mexico right now. And it's actually creating higher costs for our goods coming yeah. back in. And I think it should, personally, because well, I don't think we should be paying these people bullshit wages. Yeah, be- basically what we're looking at is is it's the... Um the zero sum game. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Like, the, there's a certain amount of economic prosperity and a certain amount of political prosperity in the world. And when you send, you know, jobs into a certain country, you're going to elevate that country's quality of life. And so it has to reduce somewhere else. And that reduction, wherever that place is, somewhere else, those that's where the jobs are going to go. They're, they're always going to kind of flow like water to the lowest point. And so we're going to. Re- if we keep sending money and and jobs to Mexico, eventually we're going to send money and jobs to Ecuador. We're going to send money and jobs to uh, El Salvador. Like it, wherever it's cheaper, that's where money goes. And China, the same situation. Like we sent all of our money to China. You know what's happened? Chinese people have started to go to cool, go to school. They've got started to learn. They started to realize, hey, this is kind of bullshit. We don't like the way that you know the government's censors twitter and facebook and you know we're gonna fight it but you have an elevation of the quality of life and so obviously the money is going to trickle down wherever the jobs are going to go they're going to go to the cheapest place that that idea you know that's not a that's an un, that's not an uncommon thing i would i would hope that you know in the u.s we consider you know sending money to, to mexico and, and raising the quality of life in mexico it's not a bad thing. It's like with the, with well, that the, wasn't with the, free the point of what they did, though. They, they did this to make more money. It wasn't well, yeah. because they were concerned about people or they go, hey, we know statistically speaking, you guys going to make more money. They, they didn't think that. That's no. not how it worked. They just saw a immediate return short-term. on their investment. Yeah, it's and, short-term stuff we were yes, talking about. Yep. And, and they, they made that decision because of the large economic impact it had to their business. And And, and you put in here, you know, in 2005, a foreign-born male sampled by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, Labor Statistics had an average income of 523 a week, 69% of the average native-born workers. So almost 70% of people made less than 523 a week. In 2005, a week. yeah. Yeah. And since most illegal workers earn less than other immigrants, and since they avoid surveys... We can virtually certain be certain that illegal immigrants earn less than twenty four k a year on average, and workers who earn so little pay very little pay income tax anyway. Yeah, like you're right, and this I mean I great... did my taxes for years. It, it, when 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 I made less than forty grand it, with all my deductions for kids, yeah, they they lowered me to under that twenty four k. I always got money back. Every time. And so people are arguing over bullshit. <laughs> I know. They're like, they're like, oh, yeah, you're stealing our money. But in reality, if we paid them what they're making now, they, they fucking wouldn't have paid taxes in the fucking first place. <laughs> well, this, it's this insane. Is a great, it's a great Mother Jones article. And this one here is basically saying it's like, you know, the immigrants that are coming in, the immigrants that are going to pay, what's their, what's their average income? How much money are they making? How much money would they be making? Would they be... No, naturalized citizens. Well, they're making so little money that even if they were naturalized citizens, the amount of income they would put in as far as taxes and what they would pay in is so little that it's relatively negligible. It's like we're looking at the people at the bottom of the totem pole. It's like, okay, these people are fighting to stay alive, making less than $20,000 a year. <laughs> yeah, and, and they're not going to be putting in huge amounts of taxes. It's exactly. just not going to happen. And even if they were, right? Even if they were, because I've heard this argument out of a Republican's fucking mouth, right? <laughs> that I have. That if <laughs> they make that money, right, they would put taxes in. They would have to pay these taxes. That because there's so many of them, it would add up to a large amount of money. And then I sat there and said, wait, we want that many fucking Poor people? Come on, what is wrong with you? <laughs> like at that point, we go, they make that little amount of money, and there's a lot of them? Okay, we have a problem in our society where people are making a fucking enough to live on. I mean, come on, it's simple. It's, it, it, uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, it's just it's simple. It's pretty tough, and so like basically, it's not tough. How is this tough? Well, no, it's it's pretty tough to basically understand, like, or, or like come to terms with this. Like, I, it's not. Some- it's because they're greedy fucks. I'm sorry. Well, yeah. Maybe I'm emotional right now, but they're greedy fucks. Yeah, well, they're no. fucks. <laughs> basically, what I mean is like it's difficult to come to terms and understand with how someone can overlook something basically is this simple. Uh, we. I, I have in there, there's a um, this guy named John Max, and he wrote a book called The Vanishing Taxpayers in the National Journal. And uh, we said basically that we can, be, um, we can be confident that the majority of illegal immigrants fall below that income threshold at which we pay income taxes, where they become significantly positive. So the, 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 the return on the income taxes for the illegal immigrants is significantly lower than, you know, let's say someone making fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year. So it's like not that the illegal immigrants work they they pay no taxes. They all pay taxes, sales tax, through rent, property taxes and uh but uh those whose jobs are on the books, like the, the, everybody's saying that the the majority of these Im- illegal immigrants are working cash only under the table. Well, I don't know if you know too many people who can can pull that off, but Big companies, companies that have a few employees who keep legitimate books, you can't just be flinging cash all over the place. You got to keep track of your funds. And so I don't believe, you know, this, this massive cash influx, paying people on cash on the end and um, skipping all of the taxes and stuff. It, I believe it's a lot more rare than what, um, you know, you hear in the, uh, the ether. But those whose jobs are on the books, they use false security, social security numbers, and they also have an income tax and payroll taxes withheld from every paycheck. So the, the researchers estimate that 55 to 60% of the illegal immigrants that are paid on the books, they the, the proportion is higher in factories and service industry, but uh, lower in agriculture, because obviously they're, they're not going to be doing a lot of um, payroll stuff in there. But like even the Anti-Immigration Center to Immigration Studies uses the figure 55% in this work that's saying that these people, 55% of illegal immigrants are paying legitimate taxes and that money's coming in, but they're not getting anything back. That's wrong. I, it, it's different if they're not paying any taxes at all and they're reaping all of these benefits that apparently Republicans say that everyone gets an amazing amount of benefits. Well, Amazing. Yeah. Oh, shit. <laughs> Damn it. You got, got me. got you shots all around. Oh, man. Well, either way, like... But conservatives and stuff are saying that you know this this country is just filled with all of these great benefits that you can just get all willy nilly. Well, it's really hard to get a lot of benefits. It, it's not easy to just swindle the system. And if it was, like, I would have a problem with that. I would have a problem with people, you know, faking the system out. But these people are trying to survive. Like you said, fifty people in a house. My neighbors, there's you know three or four or five different nationalities. There's a ton of people living in in my neighbor's house, and I went over and saw them, and they're all great people. It's not it's not a situation where people are trying to like hook the government and trying to to bilk out the system. These people really want to just make it. They want to be they want to be comfortable. And they want to have a good life. They want they want the American dream, right? You know, just if if you work hard, you can you can have something nice too. I I don't see that being a problem. And I'm I'm comfortable with people who are willing to work hard and to make it a little bit easier for them to come to this country and get a job. I, I, I personally would love to take the majority of the people that are illegals and say, you know what, come in here, legitimately pay your taxes and bust your ass, and we'll, we'll, we'll cover it. And we can all fight the super rich people that are taking over our political processes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and on that note, Hannah, I agree with you. I think, <laughs> I don't know, I just... It befuddles me because those the numbers you throw out just make make it even feel even more insignificant that what we do makes a difference. We we need to change society a lot more to help a lot more fucking people because I can't, I, can't, I don't know I just can't even imagine these people making that little of money and having to pay for their families and their kids and give people good lives. It's just it's insanity to me. Yeah, it's tough. I, it I is. basically I always try to just uh, try to find the best way for them to get in. You're right. And so, as we wrap the show up and we we move to the end for the end of the week, and it's been a difficult week, folks. It really has. Make sure you go over to Team Tiny Dancer, help out as much as you can. Go to GoFundMe TeamTinyDancer.com. 
Oh, fuck, that doesn't make sense. Go to Team Tiny Dan or go fund me for slash Team Tiny Dancer dot com and make sure you donate and help the Bannister family out. Because as as we look at these poverty rates that millions of people we just talked about are involved in, it's insane the little amount of money and the improportionate distribution of wealth that's going on. It's insane. That's insane, Hannah. I'm sorry. Like, I just can't imagine an article would go, hey, they make 150% of what they should make, therefore they shouldn't get money to help them out. And you go, hold on, it takes more than that to, sell, to help them. I just, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a befuddling, it's a befuddling thing. So, Make sure you stick around, like us on iTunes, give us a 5-star, 3-star, 4-star, whatever rating you can. Give us a rating on iTunes, subscribe to us on Spreaker, and remember, prepare for the revolution. Have a good night, everyone. You've been listening to a presentation of Cellar Door Skeptics. Check us out on Spreaker. Cellar Door Skeptics dot com